And we will start with a little bit of history. Yesterday, we spoke with Master Carlos Lenz and with the President and CEO of OAFI, Mr. Dr. Vergés, about the beginnings of OAFI. But let's go further back. Let's focus on chondro protection. Well, this revolutionized the world of rheumatology. 25 years now have passed. This is enough interesting time to dedicate a few minutes to this topic. And we'll, we will be led by great experts and great travel companions over this quarter of a century, especially in previous years with Dr. Burgess as well. Allow me to introduce them one at a time. First, we will introduce the President and CEO of the OAFI Foundation so that he can provide some context about these 25 years of chondro protection. Dr. Vergez, the floor is yours. Welcome. First things first, good morning to you. Thank you for being here. I imagine that the auditorium will fill up gradually. It's difficult in the morning, but yesterday we did indeed had a good time, and today we will have a good time. We expect to have a good time tomorrow, too. Thank you for being here. Thank you for prioritizing here. When we designed this panel, we did so thinking about or thinking that a group of doctors from Spain 25 years ago started to work on a concept that we thought was, well, what is this about chondro protection? Is there any chondro protection? Does it exist? I think it's very nice 25 years later to be able to say that we were right, that this is very important because sometimes in life you do something and then you look back and you may believe that you didn't do things well, but I believe we did things really well. And let me say that we were world leaders the group of pioneers that will be speaking today and many others that won't be able to come, but this group of 50, 60, 70, 80 doctors of different specialities of rheumatology, pharmacology, or clinical pharmacology, sports medicine, trauma, rehabilitation, and other GPs. We developed this concept, and nowadays, we have drugs that fulfill the requirements that we mentioned. So how you have prepared? I don't know whether we can put the presentation on screen. What is chondro protection? It's a set of pharmacological and non-pharmacological measures aimed at preventing. That's very important. Prevention is important. We spoke about this yesterday. Delaying. Delaying. The more we delay, the better. This is a basic concept we mentioned yesterday, too. Stabilizing. That is to prevent it from going any further and even total reparation would be great. This would be our final target, to repair the joint and to prevent it from being or from using a prosthesis. This is a concept of chondro protection to prevent, delay, stabilize and repair the joint. In this sense, as I said, 25 years ago, a group of Spanish medical professionals, specialists in clinical pharmacology, rheumatology, traumatology, family medicine, sports medicine, and rehabilitation physiotherapy, started to work on the concept of contraprotection. I remember that the Ministry of Health said to us, Giuseppe, what is this about contraprotection? And I said to them, isn't there neuroprotection? Isn't there dermoprotection? Why can't we talk about chondroprotection? With the years, this concept has already become a reality. So as I said, we were pioneers worldwide. If I told you the amount of hours, meetings, conferences, Sometimes it tends to happen when there's a new concept, it's difficult to implement it. There is resistance. Many are resistant to change, and we saw that for many years. What does chondroprotection consist of? Chondroprotection is not just pharmacological therapy. It also includes knowledge. 
For instance, what we're doing over these three days is chondro protection. Knowledge so that you can have good nutrition, good diets, proper rehabilitation. Today, Maria Jose will discuss what things can be done as a physiotherapist, suitable footwear, physical therapy in the case of a spa, dietetic and nutritional steps to be followed, the, anti the, natu the natural non-inflammatory Mediterranean diet, psychological care. That is also contraprotection. Having a psychologist or a psychiatrist who can really help you attack, address your anxiety or the depression that OA patients may have, and of course, drugs. Medication is key. You know that glucosamine, chondro chondroitin sulfate, and we've heard comments that have not been suitable in relation to these drugs. These are drugs approved by the Spanish Medicines Agency, funded thanks to us, and they still show and provide evidence, as what Dr. Pa Pamias will show. There are data showing that they reduce the incidence of strokes and myocardial inf infraction. I would like to thank this group because we've had to hear very uh, comments that should have not been made. The, this is a group formed by renowned scientists, clinicians, and many of those who participated conducted clinical trials. Spain was pioneer in the clinical trials with chondroprotectors. So when people say these drugs do not work, it's false. It's fake news. If they have no money, they should say they will not pay for it. But they shouldn't say that they, they do not work. Let's make this clear. I said so many times in the ministry and at the regions, if you have no money, say you will not pay. But don't say this doesn't work. This is false. It's unsuitable. And then it also damages our professional ethics. If you do not agree, talk to the patient. Don't don't talk, talk to the doctor. Don't talk to the patient. These things are absurd. So we'll start with a discussion. OK? Yeah. Now let's ask pioneers of these 25 years of condor protection to join us. Let's welcome Ingrid Moller, rheumatologist, director of the Poal Institute of Rheumatology. Dr. Muller, good morning. Welcome, Ingrid. Take a seat, please. So when you look back 25 years ago, we, you, we, I was, you were studying, we were studying medicine. What comes to mind first? How did you experience those times when there had to be a lot of communication? Some people did not understand these people from Spain and wondering what they were doing. How did you witness those moments? Were they complicated? Maybe they were. In any event, I think that's something important to mention. When you see a project that has been created and generated by companies led by what I think was a benchmark of honesty, a great entrepreneur. And when we're talking about a project led by the scientific community, by a pharmacologist like Josep Berges, accompanied by people present in this room, by brilliant biochemists, chemi chemists, pharmacologists. You truly believe that this must be true, and you think that this is something robust, or something that works. So at that time, I saw it as a solid, robust project supported by people that one should and can trust. In medicine, not only do you believe, you demonstrate things are not based on faith, they're based on science. And science was able to demonstrate. Let's also welcome Professor Xavier Carnet, technical clinical pharmacologist. Professor Carnet, Dr. Carnet, welcome. Dr. Muller just mentioned the role of clinical pharmacologists. 
I imagine that you received a call from Dr. Vergés, right? Both of you are clinical pharmacologists. So what was your first thought when he said to you, Xavier, we're going to do something about contraprotection? Well, first there was a conflict of interest because I am on both sides of this story because I suffer from hip osteoarthritis and I'm very well attended and cared by Ingrid. So there was a certain conflict of interest. It's not the same thing to work with a pathology where you do not suffer it than doing it. But 25 years ago, you didn't have your hip problem, did you? No, I didn't. When you answered your phone and, and Giuseppe said to you, hey, Xavier, I, I, I have this. Well, first, I became interested in a group of drugs which I will, as I will mention later, have several serious inconveniences so that the usual evidence would show efficacy and safety through clinical trials. First and foremost, not all countries consider these substances drugs. In some countries, by regulation, they are drugs. In others, they are not. And this already brings about some sort of an atypical situation by many. Because the methodology of studying a clinical trial on a drug is not usually applied to products known as nutraceptic products. How are these products considered in Spain? In Spain, they are considered as drugs, yes, but in other countries, they're not. For instance, in Anglo-Saxon countries, and I think that this is already one first element of distortion with respect, it complicates communication, you mean, yeah. So let me, Professor Carnet, to greet Jordi Montfort, rheumatologist, head of the rheumatology service at Hospital del Mar. Dr. Montfort, welcome. And please, Dr. Vergés, join us too. We also have a guest, Dr. Vergés says. Dr. Fernando Garcia Alonso. Of course. Fernando, join us, please. Dr. Monfort. Dr. Monfort. I called him the Messi of osteoarthritis. Let me ask you, what was there before? It is true that there is a past before contraprotection, of course. But what happened is that the pharmacopoeia we had, the amount of resources we had to treat osteoarthritis was not that big. OA has a problem, which is, among other things, the lack of an extensive pharmacopoeia, that is, a set of drugs we could use to treat patients, because not all patients with OA have the same kind of OA. Can you imagine someone who finds it difficult to see, and we told him, those who have problems seeing, we will operate them of uh, short-sightedness. Maybe we could resolve the situation of some, but not all. We need to better classify each case. To do so, and then be efficient, we need many different drugs. And we had little. But before contraprotection, we had even less. So what did we do? We did measures, hygienic and dietetic measures, nutritional measures, as Dr. Virgis mentioned. Maybe we asked people to get thinner. We trying to gain muscle volume, but we find it difficult. Those of us doctors also find it difficult. We understand the situation patients are in. And then there are conventional painkillers too. Teclofenac, ibuprofen. Now, the age group affected by this is especially that of people over the age of 65. Where? If you give a Pink, an anti-inflammatory drug, you will might lead to liver problems, kidney problems, stomach problems, so on and so forth. So these are drugs that were limited with very notable adverse effects. And then came the concept of chondroprotection. I like it, the way Dr. Bridges explained it. 
But I would like to mention one more thing. The patients, the OB humans, are like light bulbs. Why? Because we have some kind of programmed obsolescence. Because we have a cartilage. Within it, there are chondrocytes that secrete a series of substances that we all know about, collagen, hyaluronic acid, everything is in there. When we're 20 years old, these chondrocytes, which are the sources that, sec that secrete all of these substances, are sources that flow perfectly well. But when you turn 50, 40, 45, that source starts secreting less and less because we are genetically programmed for it to be th this way. So this mass is more, resists less change. And when we turn 65, the situation worsens. And with less effort, it becomes more deteriorated. Dr. Virgis did this before I did. So many said, if there is nothing that can allow these chondrocytes to be activated and there's nothing else we can do, maybe we can block a molecule but that can be toxic. Let's do something simple. Whenever the body is not able of manufacturing, let's provide it from the outside. And this simple action tend to be the best, and it worked. And today, this panel is called 25 Years, A History of Success. Yes, but we could have called it, we were right. We were right. But to reach success, first, there are stages in life. There comes a moment when you were almost encountered some unsolvable problem. And Professor Garcia Alonso, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Was there any moment in time when you had arguments and when you discussed where you didn't see a way out, when you thought that these Anglo-Saxons don't really know what we're doing, when we looked at the map and we saw Spain irradiating the world over, was there any moment when it was said, hey, the hours, the effort that we are dedicating to this project are not worthwhile because there's no way out. Did you give up at some point or considered giving up? Xavier described it really well. The general environment was against us. When this drug was subject to the approval of the Spanish Medicines Agency, or at that time it was the General Directorate for Drugs, the scientific committee was not, let's say, inclined to approve the product. But they didn't count with my presence, right? So I did my best and I convinced them. I said to them, this must be approved. That's a summary. Maybe I could have made a mistake. I don't know whether I was right or wrong, but I was the person who as Dr. Purchase knows, I was the only one who believed in this. It was not a question of faith. There were tests and there was evidence, but there was a negative bias from the Anglo-Saxon world. Many said, no, this is worthless. But historically, I was there. I knew the lab. I knew your boss, Mr. Vila. He was a holy man, I would say, and I truly believed this was something to be defended. There were funny things. These people manufactured this product. They also manufactured eparins. And I remember speaking to my political bosses that don't usually pay too much attention to me, and I said, countries need strategic mechanisms in the event of war. In the event of war, it can be COVID or it can be the war in Ukraine. And I said, vaccines, as we have seen, epirins, I can see it now with, with pancreatic strata. These products that can be difficult to obtain, when there is a situation of crisis, each country will store these products with a view. And I saw this vision of future that this company had things to be said and heard. Well, today we will take a photograph. Jordi is already taking photographs, and I would like to take a photograph from 25 years ago, how young this group would have been. They are already young now. Just imagine how young they were. Now we are connecting with Madrid 
Tomorrow, he will be here with us. But yesterday, there was a Champions League. Let's not talk about football today, because those of us here and those of them there, it's best that we don't approach. Some of us wouldn't mind talking about football. Yes, but you played yet the day before, on Tuesday. So let's greet Dr. Jose Maria Villalon, also a trustee of the OAFI Foundation, member of the medical services of Atletico de Madrid. Good morning. Hi, good morning to you all. It's a pleasure to take part in this great event, in this OAFI Congress. Patient Foundation. It's a pleasure to share this table with all of you. Because we are colleagues, friends, we've known each other for many years, at least 25 years, which is what we are celebrating today. We're celebrating 20 years of chondro protection, and we feel proud for having participated over our career in this world of joint health and chondro protection. The first 25 years, we only hope that when we celebrate the 50th anniversary, we can meet again and celebrate. Let's greet Dr. Luis Celada, doctor of the Spanish national football team, medical services. You will be going to Qatar very soon. So, doctor, when did chondro protection come to be in sports medicine. When did sports medicine consider using chondro protection? Good morning to you all. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, it's been 25 years already. Well, some say, Tango said, says 20 years is nothing. 25 years is nothing too. 25 years ago, I was playing football in Spain. I used to play for Unión Deportiva Las Palmas. And back then, I started hearing about chondro protection. It was still a topic that was far away from me, but now I should thank you for everything you have done. I speak more as a patient than as a doctor, and I know very well the progress that has been made on this matter and how much you and we are helping as doctors our patients because indeed there are many other measures that can help improve joint health. But pharmacology is a very important part, and I would like to congratulate you for it. It is usually said that when we start, steps are small, but as we conduct research, steps are bigger. What is the present? And above all, what is the future you see, Dr. Villalon, in the area of chondro protection? I think we can talk about these molecules as molecules of the 21st century. This is a new therapy that provides us with very interesting therapeutic mm, alternatives, and in most cases without adverse effects. So the OA patient can benefit from these molecules. And I also believe and nowadays we can speak of innovations, new molecules that will find their way and we hope they will be more efficient, more effective in joint health. So we are opening up the door, a hopeful door for the OA patient, for the millions of patients with osteoarthritis, with different joints affected or different locations being affected. And I think it is very important for someone to do something against our osteoarthritis, such as your foundation. I would like to highlight the word hope. Since this is a congress about patients of OA, and since through our YouTube channel, anybody from around the world can follow us. And yesterday we saw the amount of people following us from Mexico, Argentina, Peru, the United States the speaking Spanish audience, and a quick answer. People with osteoarthritis, people suffering, like Professor Carnet, do they have reasons to say, I will have a better quality of life in a near future? And can new generations think this Osteoarthritis is something that has been explained to me, but even if I suffer it, it won't damage, it won't prevent me from having a good quality of life. 
Of course, yes. Yes to your first question. That is, yes, they can have hope in seeing present and future measures. And the new generations obviously will need to prevent. That's the best thing they can do. And undoubtedly, they will e have an even better quality of life because we are progressing. If your question is, have we found perfection? The answer is probably, obviously, no. The situation is not perfect. But we have a foundation that is trying to move ahead to try to ensure the very best for OA patients. So we are on the right track. Yes. Yes, but I would I would like to focus on the why. We are encountering problems to achieve a general consensus. We're talking about drugs, which, as Dr. Castaneda yesterday and today Dr. Monfort said, that are not just one entity. There are different situations that respond to different pathologies that are not all the same. And next, the locations that need to be considered. Finally, it was just said that there are few undesirable or adverse effects. Paradoxically, this could be a problem because a usual thought of a doctor is if a product does not have adverse effects, it's placebo. It has not desirable effects. And the most important thing for me is the unique objective biomarker is images. Pain is an entity that we cannot measure well. Visual analogic images is what are, is used, but in a chronic disease with pain, where intervention is not immediate because the effect of the drugs is not immediate, the problems to demonstrate TIT in a clinical trial are greater than in other contexts. I believe all of these things need to be considered to better understand why there has been resistance by a sector of the profession. Dr. Monfort, I believe there is hope for patients with, with osteoarthritis. I truly believe that. There are many molecules under development right now from different areas. There is an attempt of stratification of patients. So we're talking about different diseases that are very similar, but they seem to converge. But after all, we're talking about discreetly di different entities. Now, no matter how many specific molecules we create or specific antibodies, they will probably not replace the other ones. And this is interesting, and you realize about this with the years. Let me give you an example. In OA, we had calcium and vitamin D, and then we gave anti resolutive drugs, but they didn't replace them. With rheumatoid osteoarthritis, we started with anti inflammatory drugs and then with biological drugs. We still provide metatrexate and occasionally corticosteroids, corticoids. So I believe there will be basic drugs cooperating to reduce the pain, low voltage, and then we will see on top of these other more sophisticated drugs with more specific targets, but together with contraprotectors. I think we are here to say what we believe will happen. I believe this will happen. What about you, Dr. Fernando? Let me tell you a secret which I believe is important. A healthy person is an undiagnosed patient. I know it sounds sad, but this is what it is. So we all have something. Yes, all of us here are OAEs. We have OAE or else we will sometime soon, because OA is not a condition in the most raw sense. It's the logic development in human life. I mean, if you leave further enough, you will eventually have OA. So this is a universal issue. Of course, there are some patients that unfortunately start with OA at a very early age, with a bloom in their development. But then the healthiest of patients 
if live long enough as Dr. Carnet can attest here, and he was so young, and yet I've seen him limping here. I mean, this is what it is. So I'm, I'm sure I'm coming next, but this is what it is. Let's accept that, and I think that this gives us a true perspective of the value of OAE and how misappreciated it is in society. Yes, but we are talking about a condition that's having an impact on 7 million Spaniards, roughly, with a healthcare expenditure of several millions. And you say that we spend 4 billion euros and yet the patient is unhappy. He, you always say that, that something's going wrong. Contra protection is also considering helping preventing these costs so that people will feel better, have a better quality of life, and therefore they will have to resort less to drugs? Yes, absolutely. And today you will listen to Dr. Roman Freixas Pamias, and he will tell you about a couple of works we've done with the Spanish medication agency with one of the pharmacologies that we have in here, where we prove that people with uh, cardiovascular risk and OA, this reduces 40% of infarction and 20% of stroke. But what's the cost for an OA, for an infarcted patient or with a stroke? So, and these are cheap medications, by the way. Let, let me throw a couple of comments here. Why is this a safe product? And I agree with Dr. Kearney, because it's an endogenous substance. It's in our body uh, as a disulfate. But then most take place in the liver, and, and it's not metabolized. And where most drugs are metabolized. So it's just impossible to have a pharmacological interaction. Hence, the security, the safety of the medication. That's a very important thing. And then I would also like that, well, all of us here have actively participated on these. And this was the effort of many people like you here people, they all contributed, but I would like to bear in mind some names, such as Dr. Rosen from Canada, from Canada, he was my professional mentor in Canada, and Professor Antonio Garcia, or Dr. Pelletier and Jordi himself, he, he was trained with Pelletier's group in Montreal, and I'd like to also bear in mind many GP doctors that participated, or doctors on rehabilitation, on sports medicine. Dr. Villalon was a pioneer in using hyaluronic acid in Spain. And so we made that possible. So there is a group of doctors that made that possible, and we need to appreciate their effort. And again, we had to conf um, a company that was not well known in the medication industry, but that was a world leader in heparin, and it is because of heparin that I'm alive, because I went, I had COVID myself, and access to heparin and dexamethasone um, really worked well with me. That was a medication that was a first-line medication and often not known for the healthcare practitioners, but lucky to me you were there. And then, same thing with Consotin. And then there was this group of people, and it took some time indeed, because as you were saying, these products are animal-based, and chondrosulfate, it comes from bovine sources, and chondrosulfate from uh, a crest of a, chick, of a roost, and glucosamine from shrimp skin. So there are different active ingredients, different therapeuticals, non-glamorous osteoarthritis. So I'm saying so in order to stress these and to drive my point home. But anyway, heparin, that's quite a thing. It comes from the 
Pix Mucus. As the one we have in Palafolls, uh, we have a company there, but there is also, for instance, Sanofi with the famous Klexin, but this heparin is manufactured here in Spain. And I have, by the way, no shares no, on these companies. Even uh, I was working there, but now I'm in OAFI. That's now my company, an outstanding company. Anyway, this is what it is. Just five more minutes because we have Professor Inigo Nino Becerra in here. We should also bear in mind Professor Villa. Yes, yes, we wanted to surprise him, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. The founder, yes. Yes, I'm sure that he will be able to see that later on. Yes, I would like to greet Dr. Villa. Dr. Villaron, a pioneer, as uh, Dr. Rogers said, on hyaluronic acid, on control protection. But there are not many football players, the one, I mean, professional football players, top football players, when are 35 or 40 that have their knee hurt or a hip that needs to be fixed. And these young top golden boys, these 20, 21 year olders, and you have some of them at Electico de Madrid, can you take care of them better? Maybe they can have an end of their active career in and lead into a more standard life. And you may know that there are some football players that are 35 or 40 and they can no longer play football with their own kids because their in their knees and hips are d so badly damaged. Can you improve on that? Well, this is what we're here for. I, I think that our mission is more on the preventive side as a sports doctor. And I must say that at least we should minimize the risk for an injury. It's true that often the bill that these top uh, sportsmen play is this early OA. And this is what we are struggling against. Well, apparently he got offline. But while we go back to him, Dr. Celada, and I'm guessing that now you are watching the football matches, hoping for the players not to injure themselves, and this one that's about to be in the international team, let's hope and that he's really suited for it. Is there an international consensus on contra protection when talking about football players to have a contra protection so that later they can lead a normal life? Yes, of course, as Dr. Villalon was just saying, one of our roles is on prevention. And in the case of the present football players, but let me say that basically the main work is by the previous football players and that are still part of the technical staff now because often you find former football players with a patent OA and they also want to keep themselves active either training or playing and this would be the main challenges we're facing and we need to often confront that once the osteoarthritis is there and then with present football players when it comes to prevention, well, we try and guide them in as much as possible because it's true that joint injuries, well, they are a burden into most of their futures. So one of our main roles is indeed prevention. Now, we don't have more time. Anyone that would like to add anything else? No? So hooray for contra protection. Is that? OK, hooray for contra protection. And hopefully 25 more years of research, work, and knowledge. Yes, thank you. Thank you for coming. I was really happy to see you here. Jordi, Xavier, Ingrid, Dr. Celada, Dr. Villalon, and Dr. Villa as well. And to all doctors, again, many doctors, and I would say a select group of doctors on all the specialties that 
have been struggling and fighting for this. And again, we've been pioneers at world level. And I'm sure that we will get our tribute here in Spain once we're dead. But we know that even though we don't need that tribute paid. But hopefully, when it will take us some time to get that tribute. But you know that you only get a tribute once you die. Well, or like you get all the eulogies uh, and then. So, well, why not paying that tribute in advance to ourselves? And... And let's, and we will continue at OAFI providing scientific evidence. I think that Ingrid wanted to say something. Yes, on the gratitude section, I always remind fondly on the Bioimberic uh, medical team and research team. It was a great team, a great group of workers led by the men we all know. Yes. Uh, a tremendous group of experts now working at the top uh, level. And we will continue, I'm sure they will continue, but on chondroitin sulfate. Do you know how many people is taking that product on a daily basis? 50 million people on a daily basis all over the world. So saying that this does not work is like claiming there are 50 million fools a day. And I would say that this would be disrespectful. And other than scientific-based medicine, about the Cochrane Review, for instance, the, is an absolutely independent, quote-unquote, organization. According to the review on chondroitin sulfate, and we looked into the reviews, the Cochrane reviews, yeah. and accordingly, they say, well, if so many people are taking it, maybe that's because it works. Of course, there are many people taking things that do not work. But at the end of the day, the most important thing for the patient is for that product to work well for them. And if it works for them, that's great. And if it doesn't, just take it away. Thank you very much to all of you, Ingrid, Xavier, Luis Elada, Jose Burgess. There are seven of you, the seven magnificent. Thank you very much and congratulations on 25 years of success for control protection.